And now, a message from Awakening International Church. I want to speak on something this morning that you normally don't hear spoken on. And I want to talk about the spirit of truth. I want us to turn to 3 John um, 2 through 4. And I want us to, um, you're going to get a lot of scripture today. I don't think you mind that. And this scripture, we always hear the 3 John 2. And that is the scripture that says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, even as your soul prospers. We all know that scripture. I mean, that is just one of those scriptures that stands out in the epistles of John. That, that, and, and it pretty much has the understanding that as your soul prospers, as your soul takes the rest of the Lord, as your soul is infused by God, that you will be in health and you will prosper. That's what that scripture tells us. So um, we, need to, we need to walk that one out, amen. But look at the next verse here. It says, For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Somebody say, walk in truth. He didn't say run in truth. He didn't say skip in truth. He didn't say twirl down the road in truth. He said walk in truth. And so John uses the activity of walking to tell us how we ought to be active in the truth, okay? So the thing about, the thing about walking is you and I don't really think too much of it. I mean, there's not really too many books on how to walk, Okay, there's not, there's not many conversations and debates about how to walk. You know, we, we, we don't probably even remember when we did learn to walk. Most of us probably have just totally forgot that. We don't remember. But here he's using that very thing that we're to walk in truth. That we are to take those principles of walking and set them to how to walk into truth. Okay, so, so he didn't say I, that there's no greater joy than to hear or to, that the, my children know the truth. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I want them to know the truth. He said, I want them to walk it out. He said, I want them to be in it, to know it, to let it consume them, and that every day of their life, their whole lifestyle is them walking it out. So it's not so much about knowing the truth. You need to hear this today. It's not so much. The church is overflowing with the knowledge of truth. We know what to do, what not to do. We know the good things and the bad things. We know the sins. We know the, the, the glories. We know all of that. But, but God is saying, I don't want you just to know these things. God's saying, I need you to walk them out. I need you to live them every single day. That as you are walking, you are carrying these things. And in everything, just like, just like walking, most of us don't even pay attention to where we're walking. I mean, we know where we want to go. And so we, we know just to get there. Now, if we're on rough terrain, we might watch the terrain in front of us, and, but yet there's still an ease in that, okay? Even people that know how to hike and climb, there's an ease in that. They learn to do that. So even in the climbing and in the walking, all of those things, the Lord wants us to learn to walk again, and He wants us to learn to walk in truth, and He wants us to do it one step at a time. Because if you take the whole word of truth and you try to put that into your heart all at one time, it will be almost, it will be so difficult for you to do that. But you know how Holy Spirit is. He takes different um, nuggets of the truth and He brings them to you so that you may shift your paradigm, you may shift your thinking so that you can walk in truth. There are times when you've been walking this something um, specific out. You've been walking in this for a long time, and, and then the Lord comes along and says, I don't want you to walk in that anymore. But Lord, I walked in that for five, ten years. What was wrong with it then? See, there's a new revelation of walking in the truth. So even, even with children, 
They, when they're learning to walk, there's this place where they must, um, they, they must learn to navigate. They must learn to, to, um, to not hit walls. They must learn not to, you know, uh, they, they need to navigate. And so, so we need to navigate the truth. And so that's what this message is about today, is about you and I learning to walk in the truth. Now, you might say this is just a simple message, but um, uh, we'll ask you after it's done and see if you still agree on that. Um, See, the thing is, Holy Spirit is truth, because Jesus told His disciples at the Last Supper that the, the, the Holy Spirit was coming. Comforter was coming. And what did he say? He will lead you into all truth. Okay? So he's pretty much telling those guys, don't act like you're walking in the dark when you're walking this truth out because you've got a light within you. You have Holy Spirit in you that will show you which way to go, show you what to walk away from, what to walk with. He'll show you these things. So, so he was saying um, um, the truth is with you. The truth is with you. But see, the problem is, how much, how much of a degree of the truth are we actually walking in? I mean, that's something to really, to really think about. How much of the degree of truth are we walking in? And see, there's places in our life where we may be walking in ignorance, thinking that it's the truth. See, Ephesians 4.15 in the Amplified, it says, let our lives longingly express truth. Now, see, I'm telling you, this is all about truth. The Scripture is all about truth. It's about God coming into the earth and bringing the word that disperses the lie. If you and I walk in truth, just as 3 John said, you will walk in joy The outcome of walking in truth is walking in joy. And so he says here, let your life lovingly, lovingly express truth. Many of you know people that they have a level of truth. And oh, they can take that truth and beat you on the head with it. They can make you condemned with it. They can make you feel just downright awful about yourself with it. But God is saying here, you need to express yourself. You need to express truth with a whole bunch of love. And then look what it says here. And he says, in all things. So once again, he's talking about every part of your life. Every part of your life. In all things, I want you to express truth. In everything of your life, I want you to walk this out. And look what what the Amplified says. It says, speaking truly, dealing truly, and living truly. This is all about having a true heart. This is what this spirit of truth is all about. This is about a people that do not walk in fakery, that do not walk in pretense, but they walk in the truth. Their life are is evidence of the truth. That everything Holy Spirit, everything that's in God's heart is now brought through Holy Spirit into ours, and we walk it out. Why? Because the spirit of truth has come to help us. So we need to realize that truth is a living spirit. So if you're going to walk in truth in all things, you're going to need some power to help you do that. You're going to need some energy to help you do it. He's saying in everything you speak, everything you walk, everything you do, everything you deal with, everything that you live through, he's saying it has to be totally filled with truth. And then it goes on to say, enfolded in love. Let us grow up in every way and in all things into Him who is the head. And He is the truth. He is the truth, the way, and the life. Now, the thing is, when I walk, when you walk, my whole body walks. Okay? Every part of me is part of the walking. Okay? And so, as, as, you, as you walk in truth... It's telling me, the Scripture is telling me that every single part of you has to be conjoined with that truth. See, that's another reason he said to walk in truth. 
If there's a part of your body that does not want to walk, you're not going to be walking. If there's a part of your body that rebels, forget it. You're going to be carried out today. You won't walk. See, that's what he's saying here. He's saying this truth has to totally encompass your life. And every place you walk, every person you deal with, everything you speak into, every place where you live and move and have your being, truth must abound in you. See, we need the truth in us. And truth is the Scripture, okay, obviously. But I'm telling you, the Scripture without the Spirit will kill you. You must have the Spirit teaching you the Scripture. You must have the Spirit causing the, the, the Scripture to be applied to you. And see, when the Scripture is applied through Holy Spirit power, then you have a portion of truth. Then truth comes into your being. And then it's the, it's the, 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 um, you have to walk it out. And sometimes when you start walking it out, you fall flat in your face. But that's a good sign. When you fall on your face, no matter how old you are in the, in the Lord, in the Spirit, it's pretty much telling you that you just got a whole new layer of truth and you just don't know how to walk it out yet. You just got, you, you know, you just got something that you're not used to yet. See, this happens to people in the Spirit. People that are being challenged by Holy Spirit to move and to walk in Him, you're going to come up against some obstacles. You're going to come up against some places where you don't know how to walk it out. You just don't know how, what's even going on around you. What is that? It's the spirit of truth has just invaded your life and gave you a new level of truth, and you don't know, you don't know how, you've never been there before. You've never walked that pathway before. But if you will give yourself time and you will trust Holy Spirit, he will have you walking in that new level of truth. See, I really believe in this day that we're in, we must have a, level, a new level of truth. We talk about new wineskins, we talk about new wine, et cetera, et cetera. But what is that? That is new revelation of truth of the Father's heart. And if we can't accept that, if we can't drink it, if we drink the new wine and throw it up, it means that the carnal nature within us is rebelling against the newness. When you see the religious that rise up and try to stop the newness, that is the spirit of Antichrist coming against the spirit of truth. When you are given something, and I've seen this so many times, I've seen this so many times in my ministry where um, I'll be teaching something, and it may be something that people have never heard, it, but, but it's, you know, and I make sure and have, you know, 10 or 12 scriptures to, to, to back it all up, but they'll just sit there, and then afterwards they come and say, well, I just don't agree with that, or else they'll leave and say, well, Apostle Brian is a false teacher, and no, it's not that I'm a false teacher, it's that you have not allowed the spirit of truth to come to a level and teach you and to train you. Because, I mean, come on, if it's all in the Word, how can you buck against that? How can you take a stand against it? See, we all need the Spirit of truth. In, um, in John chapter 5, verses 2 through 9. Now, there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porches, and then these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. We sang about this in worship today. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made whole? <coughs> what if Jesus came to you today and said, do you want to be made whole? The sick man answered him, you know, the first thing you would have thought he would have said was, well, yeah, you better believe it, buddy boy, I want to be made whole. And but he said, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. And when the water stirred up, but when I'm coming, another steps down before me. So he's pretty much saying, 
he's pretty much telling what a victim he is. There's always somebody stepping in before me. I'll never get to the water. I've been here for 38 years trying to get to the water. Nobody will help me. Wah, 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 wah. So this sick man answered him and said that. And Jesus said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Jesus was pretty much saying, hey, I don't got time for the victim stories. <laughs> don't got time for it. Do you want to be whole? That's my, that was my question. What's your answer? And immediately, immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. Do, 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 do. <laughs> not good, not good. <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of drama after that scripture. But look at this. Was that man doing something wrong? He was doing what everybody else was doing. He was there while trying to walk this thing out, but he couldn't walk. He was trying, he was sitting there right in the truth, and the truth was that there was an angel that come stir the water. That was obviously truth because there were manifestations of it happening. So he was sitting in the truth, but he couldn't walk it out. He was sitting right there, and he couldn't walk it out to the point where he could actually get his legs working again. See, this is the picture of the church today, sitting in so much truth, but they don't know how to walk it out, so they're debilitated. Their legs are atrophied. They've not been um, out evangelizing. They've not been out prophesying. They've not been out sending people out uh, into the world. They, they've not been doing these things. Why? Because they're happy sitting in the truth, and because they're sitting in the truth, they say, I must be okay. I get truth every week from my pastor. He or she preaches every week. They preaches a good word every week. Well, if it was such a good word, what did he preach last week? And how have you applied that to your life? See, there's something about the word. If we're going to walk in the word so that our joy may be full, we've got to learn to apply this thing. See, when Holy Spirit comes on you in a sermon, or, or even when you're reading and you're spending time with the Lord, and Holy Spirit just, He just comes and gets in you and jacks you up on something. You're just like, ah, that scripture, ah, oh, that, that revelation, ah, oh, that's so good. See, when that happens, that is Him coming and bringing a portion of truth that He wants to instill into you very deep. We were talking about the coal miners. It's Him penetrating the hardness. It's Him bringing revelation. And so it's not good enough to say, whoo, Holy Ghost goosebump, that was nice. Okay, on to the next thing. No, no, no. It's time to sit down and let that take a hold of you. <clears throat> it's, some of these things that the Lord gives us, it can be weeks upon weeks where He keeps moving on us with this. And He wants to do something. He wants to put that into you so deep so that you can start walking it that you can start living it. See, if you're getting revelation and it's not, it's not walkable, you better start wondering if it's true revelation. I'm going to say that again. True revelation from the Lord, empowered by the Holy Spirit, will be walkable. What do I mean by walkable? You'll be able to take that thing and walk it out. You'll be able to apply it into your life, into your heart, into whatever into your family, into your business, whatever. You'll be able to apply that. So if it's not applicable, you better start wondering, God, was that from you? So there he was, and he was sitting in the truth. But there was no fruit coming out of his life. There was nothing. I'm sorry. I don't get it. I can't understand it. People that tell us that they love the Lord God with all their heart and all their might and all this stuff, but yet there's nothing being applied. There's no truth being applied. You don't see anything different in their lives. You don't see no changes. You see the same old, same old. One thing I know about my God is He loves to change it up and shift it up, especially at times when we don't want to, <laughs> right? 
It's just who he is. He's like, I'm not going to leave you at this dry, barren place, even though you've really loved it. You know, I, I preach about this a lot about in the Song of Solomon when the, um, the Shulamites, she went into the wilderness. She was just driven into the wilderness because of her shame and didn't think God loved her and, and, or the bridegroom loved her. <coughs> but what did the bridegroom have to do? He had to go in, and it says that he took her over his shoulder. Now, if somebody comes in right now and picks you up, Angela, throws you over their shoulder and takes you out, we would all be like, she has just been taken by force, okay? And, right? Especially if, <laughs> especially if she's been, if she's resisting. And see, this is the picture of this Shulamite in the wilderness, he had to go in there and forcefully take her out because she got so comfortable. None of us in here are going to say a word about that because we've all been comfortable in our wildernesses. And you, you might be comfortable in your wilderness right now. You just don't know it. And that's why I'm preaching this message because I'm hoping that the crowbar of the Lord will come today and pry you out of the wilderness. Amen. Truth will do that. Truth can be a double-edged sword. It can be really dull on one side because we're sitting in the truth and we're all so happy. I'm in the truth. I go to a Bible preaching church. I'm in the truth. But then the question comes, how much of it are you living? How much of it are you applying? Oh, well, not so much. Well, then truth, has, truth is actually your dagger. It's actually you stabbing yourself with it. See, truth that is not applied is a very dangerous thing for anybody, not only the child of God, but for anybody. When God, Holy Spirit, comes and starts talking to you about some truth, revelation, something that needs shifted, something that He wants to teach you on, something that He wants to train you on, that's when you need just to step aside and say, Lord, I don't know nothing. God, I don't know nothing. You're going to have to train me in this. You're going to have to teach me in this. You're going to have to show me. Do you want to grow? Do you want to mature? Do you want to move forward in Him? Do you want to be conformed to His image? Well, then there is a walk in the Spirit to walk out truth. Got to walk it out. Got to apply it. You've got to be aware at every moment in your day. What is, what kind of truth is God imparting to me right now that He wants me to go the distance with? You might not be able to run the marathon because you missed some truth a couple feet back. You might not be able to, to, to be the long runner because you've missed some truth. See, we see that all the time, people, people thinking they can run the long distance, and then we see them fall, fall flat on their face, and then we're like, why did, I can't believe they fell. Wow, we thought that they were much more mature than that. See, there was a piece of truth that they could not digest. It got stuck in their throat. I'm telling you, there's a truth, there's a truth that Jesus has that will get stuck in your throat. You won't be able to digest it. It'll come and wrestle you to the floor. You'll run from it. See, that's why so many people, they have their nice little narrow road that they walk on. Well, these are the only people I listen to. This, these are, this is just, this is the only people. I listen to this one and this one and blah, blah, blah. And, and these are the only evangelists I listen to, the only teachers. What if God wants to throw in Somebody that's so out left field into your soup that totally throws the soup into chaos because the teaching that they walk in is way above you. Come on, you need to realize this. There's places, there are pieces of truth that if you swallow, you'll be choking. So what does that tell me? It tells me I need to walk this thing out. I need to know what I can chew up and what I can't chew up. And those things that are big old clumps that I think I can take one gulp and, and chew up, 
I might need to nibble on that thing for a couple years. There are some things in my spiritual life that I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I have been nibbling on for years. Several years. I mean, and God just keeps bringing it up because He wants me to walk this thing out. He wants me to move in this. But it's like every time I do, either fear comes in or, or oh, I'm not capable of doing that. And then what do I do? I have to go back to truth. I have to go back to truth and say I need undergirded again by truth. But there's places in all of our lives. It may be just as simple, I'm not saying love is simple, but it may be just as simple as loving, as loving others. You might say, Lord, I need, I need a revelation of truth on love. But it comes back to the place where you have to be asking God. You have to know yourself where you aren't walking in the fullness of truth. You must be aware where Holy Spirit is talking to you that He wants you to rise to another level in whatever that truth is. Maybe it's healing. You know, I always think of, um, um, uh, is it Jody Osteen? Jody Osteen? Um, okay, we're going to call her Mrs. Osteen. Um, you know, she ended up having cancer, and she was only given months and so she didn't really have a revelation of healing, but she knew that she needed truth. Truth had to come into her innermost being. Truth was no longer something that she set in. Truth had to come into the inside of her. See, this is when your life becomes very strong and very secure and very joyful, is when the inside matches the outside that what's going on in here is matching how you live. And so she started living in healing. She started taking that scripture and just pouring it into the depth of her. And that woman has been healed for decades. And not only has she, but she has helped so many other people to know that the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. See, if I am living one thing out here, making believe, putting on a pretense, putting on a mask that I am so holy, I am a partial Brian, and make sure and say the apostle part really loud when you say it because I want everybody to know that, and I walk so holy, and oh, I've done this, and I've done that, and I've done this. Oh, 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 oh. But you know what? If I've got all that on the outside and in the inside, it looks all wonderful on the outside, but the inside is just a mess. The inside is just full of dead men's bones. The inside is just full of worms eating away. There's no truth in you. If you have one part of mistruth in you, you don't have truth. I kind of thought this was going to be a jump up and down and shout meeting. Uh, <laughs> See, Jesus was right out there in the open. He said, I <laughs> am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. I mean, when somebody speaks like that, they are pretty darn secure in who they are. I mean, they've had an experience. See, you don't see people speaking like that that are just positionally in truth. What am I talking about? Well, I'm a Christian and I'm born again, and I am positioned in truth because that's what the Bible tells me. Well, that's wonderful. God bless you. But now you need to let that position up here just take a, a slide right down into your heart. And you need to have an experience with the way, the truth, and the life. See, that's, that's what I'm talking about today. If you and I are going to walk out this truth, it's going to be this place where we're going to be, we're going to be harassed by the Lord all the time. I'm going to, I use that word harass very freely because he will step in at any time and say, hold the boat, hold the curtain, let's deal with some things. Let me tell you something because I don't want you harmed and there's something in your thinking, I need you to get aligned. 
especially when somebody starts preaching something, and then you go to the next place where you hear a, a, a teaching, and the next place, and the next place. And it's the same thing over and over. Um, it's like, hello, is there anybody in there? Hello, is there anybody in there? Because I, I, I am comfortably numb. That's the, that's the name of the song, Comfortably Numb. And that's exactly where the church is at. That could be a worship song. It would probably make a lot of people run from the church. But, but we're comfortably numb in the truth. That's what I'm talking about today. And we need to pick this thing up. And some of this truth is like boulders. Seriously, some of this is like boulders. And you've got to roll it on your back. And you've got to carry this. And then he says, okay, I want you to go this way. And then you realize it's all uphill. It's like, Lord, I mean, this is what truth will do to you. Truth will crush every part of who you are out of you so that all your opinions are no longer your opinions. I mean, come on, all you do need to do is look on Facebook. You don't see prophecy. You see opinions. Those are not prophecies. They are somebody saying, this is what I feel. This is what I sense. No, it's truth. See, there's a place where we need to get to, church, where we come to that place of brokenness that we realize that we don't know truth as we ought to know truth. Every day there's new truth. Every day there's something new to learn. Every day he's trying to take us up. You know, I had that vision of the bride ascending the stairs here several months ago. Step to step by step by step by step. What is that? That's ascending into his image. So it's not even easy, especially if you have like a 500-pound wedding dress on. And then he's decided to put a big old boulder of truth on your back too. It's not easy, but I tell you, don't stop. Don't stop. Years ago, they used to make, they used to make silver, um, silver dollars out of silver, <laughs> okay, um, as the name describes. They used to make it out of silver, but, but when the, the new silver-plated dollars were introduced, there was only one way to figure out, uh, okay, you, hold, on, hold on to this one. There was only one way to figure out if it was actually true silver, and what you had to do is you had to drop it on the floor. And when you dropped it on the floor, if it was just silver plated, it was just thud. But if it was true silver, it would ring. Like for a long time, it would ring. And so the thing was, it wasn't just the outside ringing. It was the whole entire being ringing because it wasn't a counterfeit, because it was the real thing. See, there is a new sound that's rising up within God's people. Amen. We've heard this now for years. It's, it's happening. But what is the sound? It's the sound of truth. It's the sound of truth in love. Truth speaking in love. That is powerful. Not compromising truth, but walking it out in every single way. Look at this. 2 Samuel 12 this is powerful. I'm hoping this will kind of twist this message together if you're still out there on the fringes. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him, and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, 
And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And then David said, or Nathan said to David, You are the man. <laughs> Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your, into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? For you have, king, you, you have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And thus says the Lord, Behold, I will rise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it, did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son." So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because this deed you have given great, because of this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child who is born to you shall surely die. And then Nathan departed to his house. The interesting thing about this story is there was quite a sufficient amount of time that took place between when David committed the sin and when Nathan showed up on the scene. Some scholars are actually believing it could be two to three years. Now, no, 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 just stop and think about that. Just one minute. Just stop and think about that. He killed the woman's wife or husband brought the woman in, had a child with the woman. I mean, and he just kept doing his same thing. Now, now remember, David's tabernacle was set up on the hill of Mount Zion. David was going in there and giving sacrifices of praise. David was, was doing all his kingly duties. He was being the priest over Jerusalem. He was doing all that in the midst of this sin that had never been repented for. And so, you know, it makes you wonder, well, God, why did you wait so long? Well, I think God waited so long to send the prophet because he thought that David would get it. He thought that David's heart was soft enough to get it. But I'm here to tell you today, you and I don't always get it. You and I may be walking in things, we don't always get it. I think we need to pray for more Nathans in our life. Ho, 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 ho. That would make some things exciting. I think we need some more Nathans that comes and says, oh, you're the woman. And David's pretty much, oh, I've been busted. I've been found out. And I'm sure the, the majority of his grief came from I can't believe I walked this, was just walking like everything was fine. What am I talking about here today? I'm talking about the spirit of truth that leads us into all truth, will lead us out of things that harm us, lead us out of things that are sucking life out of us, that are sucking truth out of us. The, the Holy Spirit, He's so on your side. He's so with you to walk with you and to lead you. David was in quite a conundrum. But you know, Psalm 51 is when he repented. And you know what I love about Psalm 51? This is one little, this one little clause. David says, you desire truth in the innermost parts and wisdom in the hidden parts. He's saying, God, I've learned one thing about you in all of this, that you're not going to allow me to be a fake in any area of my life. You're not going to allow me to walk out here like I got it all together when I'm messing here. 
because you desire truth way down in the depth of me. Because what is this? I know it's your belly. I know it's your stomach area. It's your solar plexus. I know that. But you know what it really is? Right here is your wealthy place. This, this is your bank. <laughs> Amen. And God says, I don't want nothing corrupt in that bank. Because it will eat away at the gold and the silver. I want your wealthy place to be wealthy. How do you let it be wealthy? Lord, I want truth in my innermost parts. I want wisdom in the hidden areas of my life. And when that starts happening, when God says, yay and amen, I'll take care of that for you, you know what happens? You end up spending a lot more time alone with God. You end up spending a lot more time alone with God because he won't let you off the hook. He'll be talking about it when you're driving. He'll be talking about it even when you're talking to somebody else. He just won't stop talking about it. But the only place to find the healing is to get alone with him and go into deep surrender. Deep surrender. Lord, I don't know how to walk this out, but I ask for the spirit of truth to come in and undergird me. Um, John 8 31 through 36. This is really an interesting scripture. To the Jews who had believed him, believed Jesus, Jesus said, now this first part's about the Jews, okay? Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. In other words, you get in the truth, you stay in the truth, then you're being discipled by the truth, okay? Okay? Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So he said, there's a process here to the Jews, he's saying, if you will get into my teaching, into my word, into my truth, and let that rise up in you, and you take it upon you, you will know true freedom. So the Jews answered, oh, this is crazy. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? You know what they were saying? We have no need of freedom. What are you talking about that your truth will set us free? We're Abraham's children. We don't need to be free. We are, we are positionally free. We are in Abraham, and we're already free. But Jesus was trying to tell them, you may be in Abraham, but you're not applying the truth of faith in Abraham to your life. And you're, you're walking around like dead men's bones. You're walking around like, like tombs. You're walking around putting people into bondage. See, we've got this in the church today. We've got those that are positionally set in truth. And those that are positionally set in truth, they will use the truth to harm you. They will use the truth to condemn you. They will use the truth to tear you down. But see, Jesus then said... Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. He's like, you're saying you're not a, a slave because you're Abraham's kid? Oh, no, no, you were born into sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs in it forever. What's a son? What's a son? A son takes all the teaching of the father upon them. They even if they don't understand it. There were so many things when I was growing up, I didn't understand what my dad was saying. I thought, he, is, he knows nothing. He doesn't know nothing. But then when I got a little older, I realized I didn't know nothing. I was the one that had no idea. So Jesus was pretty much saying the same thing to them. If you will get into my truth and you grow in it, you will have a freedom that you've never known. You will come. And see, there are some, we can look in the book of Acts, there's a whole group of them that they caught it. They caught the truth. Not only the Greek Jews, but the um, Jerusalem Jews, they both got it. There was a 
big, big amount of people that grabbed the truth and then they ran through all the world with it. So my question to you is, are you positioned in truth or are you daily experiencing truth? I can stand and say, yes, I've got the, I've got the belt of truth on today. Hallelujah. Well, that's nothing. What that means is you're positioned in truth. But what is that belt doing for you? How's that belt changing your life? How is that belt squeezing some, some old falsehoods out of you? What's that belt doing? There's something that happens when you walk in truth. 1 Thessalonians 1.5, Paul said, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but it came in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. If you want to look at that word full conviction, um, that is talking about a truth that causes you to change your mind. Okay? Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. What is Paul saying there? He's saying... We didn't only just speak out. You saw that we lived it. We lived this thing. See, there's a, there's, a real, <laughs> there's a real deficit of that in the church, of people living out truth. Why is that? Because they don't let, they don't let there be an intimacy between the spirit of truth and themselves every single day. You know, I love this story about Charles Finney. I... I speak about this a lot, but he was in Upper State, New York, and he was visiting a textile plant. And so he, was, he walked into the plant, and there was a woman that caught his attention. And so he started walking closer to her, and so pretty soon he, she saw him coming near and got her attention. And so she starts watching him coming, and he's getting closer and closer, and pretty soon she starts to shake. And by the time he got near her, she had fallen on the floor of the textile plant and started crying out, God, have mercy on me for my sins. He didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. She got born again there, and, and, the, and the story goes on to say that he didn't even speak to her that he ended up walking away, and she had a major encounter. She had an experience. Oh, I'd love that to happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to see that. I walk into Walmart, and everybody shakes and falls on the ground and rolls around. Yeah, yeah. Then everybody would really know who I am and know that I carry the Spirit of the Lord. <laughs> that would make a person disqualified because it's all about how much truth you walk in. Great conviction comes from those that have been in great truth. If you get a chance to watch the new Billy Graham documentary on Netflix, you need to watch it. Because about, about 10 minutes into that thing, you'll be bawling like a baby because of the life that he lived in truth. He lived truth. He knew the Scripture. He would not walk outside of truth. He was constantly asking Holy Spirit for more truth. Oh, but I want to have crusades like Billy Graham. You'll never have it if you don't let uh, truth have its way. And that's what's going on with so many of these young prophets today that are, have just polluted Facebook. I'm just going to, I'm telling you the truth. They've polluted Facebook. That is not prophecy. And you know what's not prophecy about it? Their lives are not purified with truth. You're like, well, how can you judge that? Because I have a spirit of discernment. And it's just pretty obvious. But there's so many, probably 99% of them on Facebook, I would never have them come in this house and puke on you. Never, I'd never let it. No, we'd have the shepherds hook at the door beating them off because they're called wolves. Because there's not a purity in life. 
purity in heart. This is the birthing that's happening that was spoken about several times here today. There's a birthing of greater truth among us. That we let Holy Spirit invade whatever closet in our life. Whatever underground bunker that we buried stuff in. We're going to end with this. Amos 7, 7 through 9. This is, this is an awesome scripture. Amos is having a vision from the Lord. Then he showed me another vision. And I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. Now this was the Lord's plumb line. Okay? This wasn't just any old plumb line. This was the Lord's plumb line. This plumb line was totally saturated with truth. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still, everybody say still. And I'm not talking S-T-E-E-L. I'm talking S-T-I-L-L. He was wondering if it was still. He had built a wall there. He came back to put the plumb line up to see if it was still straight. See, this is what God is doing in the land today. You're going to see this over the next eight months. You are going to see plumb lines dropping everywhere. You are going to see it in your own life. You're going to see it nationally and internationally. What is that plumb line? Well, God, the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And he said, a plumb line. And the Lord says, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore all their sins. The pagan shrines of your ancestors will be ruined, and the temples of Israel will be destroyed. I am bringing the dynasty of King Jeroboam to a sudden end. See, that's what's happening in the world today, and it's just getting ready to increase because a plumb line makes sure that there's the standard is being held, that the truth is being kept, that, that all things are still in order, just as it was when the, 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 the vine keeper came and, and planted the vineyard and built the, the tower and everything. He's coming back to check that out, and he's bringing, releasing the spirit of truth in the earth to, to see just how straight things are. Dennis C. said last Monday, he talked about how many churches are just falling. He talked about how many churches are closing their doors. And he was bold enough to say it's because they were not walking where God wanted them to walk. They put themselves out of alignment. There's a plumb line dropping. And I'll tell you, the only thing you can do when you see it drop, you're like, well, what does that mean for me? That plumb line is when Holy Spirit starts dealing with you with something. Holy Spirit's saying, I want to give you some more truth. It's like Him coming alongside you and plop. There's the, there's the plumb line. How straight are you? How much truth are you walking in? Are you walking out what I've given you? Are you progressing into the truth that I'm giving you? Or are you just comfortable where you're at in the truth and totally disabled and you're still saying, I want, some, I want my pastor, my apostle to come pick me up and put me in the water. No. No. Nope. Nope. Come on. Everybody say a count of three. Nope. One, two, three. Nope. No. Jesus says... Jesus says, I've come to make you whole. I've come to make you whole. He's like, come on, get into my water. Get into my water. Get into my truth. Let this truth just saturate you so that you are just like a sponge that is just sopping wet. And you're so sopping wet with love that the truth is so partnered with love. See, that's what happened with Charles Finney. He didn't even have to speak and people were... You know, when he would speak, the place would go totally silent. People, people would be sitting in their pews shaking under the power because it was the fear of the Lord. I'm not here to lift up Charles Finney and say, you know, he's all great and wonderful. But I am here to say that the fear of the Lord on you as you start walking in greater truth and applying the truth of God, you'll start seeing this kind of dynamic. And I believe this house is to have that kind of dynamic. 
I don't know, all I could think about when we're talking about the coal miner and going deeper, digging down, there's only one thing that you can think about with that kind of a vision. It's all about getting deeper into truth, <laughs> getting deeper into the Word and applying it. You know, it just stinks. It so stinks when you get a preacher that gets up there and just is pouring out this scripture, that scripture, da, 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 da. I have seen way too much of that. Um, I've, actually, I've actually envied some ministers of the gospel that they could just pour out scriptures like this and tell you where they, where they live and just, because I don't got that. I, I know the concept of it. I can tell you pretty much about around about where it lives, but I know the concept of it because I've applied it to my life and, uh, during the years. But then you get to meet with them. There was one pastor that I knew that, you know, oh, he could preach, man, fire and spit flying everywhere, you know. Until you got to sit down with him and found out that him and his wife had some major issues, that his children hated him. I mean, just such a mess. I was with, a couple years back, I was asked to speak at a prophetic conference, and there was a very well-known speaker that was also on the agenda. And, um, I mean... If I said his name, everybody would know it. And so the woman that put on the conference, she said to me, would you go back and pray for blah, 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 because he's coming on next. And I was, I was going to speak the next day. Actually, I was going to speak in a um, seminar-type setting with him about the prophetic. And so I was like, yeah, I'll go pray for him before he comes on. So I went back. He was standing in the back of the room, and I, laid, I said, you know, Apostle Blah Blah wants me to, there's a lot of people named Blah Blah Blah, blah in the world. Um, um, I'm going to have to make up another name. Um, but, you know, she wants me to come pray for you, and he's like, okay. And so I laid my hands on his belly, and just kaboom, it was just like, I, I mean, the prophecy exploded, and I, you know, and I wasn't intimidated, because I'm like, you're flesh and blood, and I'm flesh and blood. And we've been saved by the same blood, and so I don't need to be intimidated with you, right? And so it wasn't that, but it just came out. Of, it just prophecy just flowed over him. Well, he's laying on the floor, bawling like a baby, and then the apostles up on the stage calling for him to come, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, sorry, but <laughs> he's kind of like <laughs> he's he's a little um, dismayed at the moment. But when he did get up, um. He had a good message, but then it was the next day. It was the next day that him and I were speaking on a panel. Um, him and I and another guy that were prophets, and there were, this was like a big youth gathering, and so they wanted the youth to be asking us questions about the prophetic. And so, um, so one of the kids got up that knew me and asked me first something about the prophetic. And I get done answering the question, and he breaks in, and literally takes a stand against everything I had just said. And I was like, this is weird. This is very weird. Well, that whole hour and a half was nothing more than him attacking me. And people in the place were like, okay, this is supposed to be a man of God. This man speaks at huge stadiums, and, and what's he doing? Brian didn't say anything. And so somebody went to the apostle of that ministry and said, you need to know what's going on. This guy is like, you know, he's lost a screw or something. But, but I knew, I knew that he was not, he was not ready for the level of prophecy that came out of me. There'll be some people that aren't ready for the level of gifting that comes out of you. And so when it does come out, because they're so wanting to be seen, there's no truth in them, you will become the enemy. Especially when their storehouse, their wealthy place is not wealthy. It's bankrupt. That was an eye-opener for me. It was an eye-opener because I was like, whoa, I get to minister with blah, 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 blah. Hallelujah. And then I was like, you are not a nice guy. And then before we left, he comes to me before the whole thing was over, and he said, you've got sin in your life, and if you don't repent of it, you're going to hell. That's what he said to me. And so I just, 
I mean, I'd had enough of him already, and I said, I'm sorry if I've offended you, but there must be something in you that was offendable. And I've read one of his books. It was all, there was a whole chapter on not being offended. You know, I was really, I was really into the vein of teaching over the years of Rick Joyner. Um, I learned a lot of prophetic from him. Of course, from Christian International. We, Michelle and I both gleaned a lot from Christian International, like a lot. <coughs> so we, we, had, we had pockets that we gleaned from. And then it was probably about five, six years ago that the Lord landed this teacher. Um, I, saw, I saw something on the Internet about him, and I went and listened, and instantly I was like, that is false teaching. Ah, false prophet, false prophet. And so I went for several days, and I heard the Lord say, <laughs> you're saying he's false because you don't have, you can't comprehend where he's at. And how can you call false what I'm not calling false? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Now, how do, I, how do I manage this one? And so it took me several years to just start being able to even attain to his teachings because the teachings seemed so high, but it was just Scripture like a machine gun at you. And, and, it was, and I'll just be very transparent with you. It was, it was about by locating and... And, and, you know, traveling in the Spirit. And I know that's a really touchy thing. You don't want to go into the bad place with that, amen? You don't want to step over a line into, like, astral projection and stuff like that. So, you know, I was just like, every part of me was screaming, no, no, no. But then I started realizing I had listened to several of his teachings, and the Lord showed me, he said, what is the very core of all this teaching. Is it to get you to travel? And I was like, well, actually, no. It's all about getting my heart totally right that whenever he wants to move me here, there, anywhere, that he can just pluck me out and take me. It's, it's all, it was all about surrender. I mean, this guy went into deep places of surrender. And I'm like, well, I love surrender. At least I thought I did when I met this guy, you know. And, but it was a whole different place of surrender. And so, I'm not telling you that I am there. Okay, don't even get that idea because I'm not. Because there are still places where I back off being like, whoa. I'll listen to 15 minutes of his latest podcast. I'm like, hold on, shut that off. I can't, t- I can't do it. That's, that's really out there. You know, it's going to take me a little while to grab this. But I say that to you because the spirit of truth, once your identity to come forth. And I don't know what that could be. And, you know, and I say this without boasting, but, you know, God has used me a couple times in that whole traveling in the Spirit thing and, and, and just doing kingdom stuff. He's used me in that. It blows my mind. It makes me so, so humbled when I return. I'm like, but, but I realize that it's not about me. It's not because I'm at this place that I'm just Mr. Wonderful. It's not that at all. That's not it. It's all about the depth of surrender. See, these things are very real. But God's coming against the the double-mindedness. He's coming against it. I can't walk this way and that way. I can't walk with a foot on the path and a foot off the path. I've got to walk in truth. I have got to be so skilled Somebody say skilled. (laughs) I've got to be so skilled with the Word of God, with the Word of truth. I've got to be so skilled listening to what Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth is telling me. And I don't want you deceived. I don't want you getting the wow factor. Because, oh, it's coming from this big minister, and it must be truth. No, just like the Bereans were. Can you imagine? Paul brings the word to the Bereans, and the Bereans are like, hold on a minute, Mr. Paul. I know they call you an apostle, but you know what? We're going to check you out. And so they told him, you just hang out till tomorrow because we're going to go into the Scripture and make sure everything you said was true. I want us to be Bereans. And obviously, they didn't find anything wrong. (laughs) So Paul must have been like, whew. 
Can I just sum this up with two words? Teachable and correctable. Letting truth come into your inward parts and abide. That when you know that it's solid truth, you'll do everything and anything to change and to make sure you're living it. Hallelujah. No compromise. <laughs> no compromise. Nope. No matter what hell throws at you, no compromise. Amen. Thank you for listening. For more, go to awakening-church.com.